Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Super comfy lay back video today. I'm just really comfy on my couch at the moment. I wanna to talk to you about 10 healthy habits for women that nobody talks about. These are things that I stumbled upon, some of them within the last year, some of them within the last few years. And these are things that I've, little small changes, quite easy transitions I've made in my life that have really contributed to just my overall health and happiness. So if you're interested in today's topic, if you're interested in, in some of the more introspective, more deeper, conversations we've been having here on my channel lately. I'd really love it if you consider subscribing, joining me here for more regular chats. So habit number one, this is something that comes off the back of my most recent video and I'm gonna have that linked if you missed it. I did touch on hormonal birth control, the method which is known as the fertility awareness method. And this could be a whole video in itself. I'm gonna touch on it very, very briefly. But basically it's been a really empowering and very powerful thing that I've learned that I've really enjoyed implementing in my life. And I'm gonna have, look, I'm about to geek out for a minute, so just strap in and bear with me. I have this really fun chart. I'm gonna have it up. I'm not gonna have the field in version because that's a little bit too personal, but this is my chart. This is a method that can be used to either avoid pregnancy or if you're looking to start a family, this, this can also be used for that. And it's one of the most powerful things that I've stumbled upon. This is my little thermometer, it's my basal thermometer. I have this particular one. I'll have it linked if you're interested. I check my temperature first thing in the morning. I fill in my chart. Some really key things that I wanna just mention with this point, because like I said, it could be a whole video in itself, but thermometer, checking your temperature every morning. CM, which is shorthand for cervical mucus, knowing what it means. And also if you wanna go so far as to check your cervix uh, and the position of your cervix. These three things play a really important role in being able to understand when you are most fertile or when you're most able to, or if you're trying to avoid pregnancy, I get at risk of becoming pregnant. I do think that there is so much power, I've said this before with a range of topics, knowledge is power. And I think keeping women in the dark about how incredible their bodies are and what their bodies are capable of naturally if you just give them the space time support to do so it's truly incredible and i think there is a reason why women aren't taught this i think there's a few reasons why women aren't taught this i don't know what the statistics are on this but i feel like if i knew i wouldn't be very surprised i feel like not very many women are taught or really know what's going on in their bodies um within a 28 day cycle within the monthly cycle that they you know they menstruate i don't think they really know much about their hormones i don't think they really know much about really what's going on in their body on a month to month basis and it's actually incredible the more you're aware of this the more you understand this it's really one of the most empowering and powerful things that you could know i think as women and i do think there's a reason why women aren't taught it the more you keep people in the dark, the more you're able to control them. I don't wanna put on my conspiracy hat, but I do think that there are fair reasons, legitimate reasons why young girls and even women are not taught these things. I think there is a really good reason why as young girls we're not taught about our bodies to the full extent that I think we should be. Eating seasonally and locally grown produce is another really big one for me. This is a habit that I recently got into and it's something that I've heard, you know, for years. People have always told me for years, you should eat seasonally, you could, you should eat local, you should eat organic. And you know, unless you really know the reasons why, it doesn't really click. Let me know if you like this in the comments down below, but you know, people can tell me, I can have a hundred people tell me, oh, you should do this, it's good for you. But unless I really understand why it's good for me, it's just gonna really float over my head and I'm just, it's not gonna connect and I'm not gonna care. It did take me a little bit of time to get used to in the beginning because I had gone from the habit of driving, you know, two minutes down the road to my local grocery store. My, lo my local grocery store is a, a huge nationwide grocery store chain. And you know, they have everything there. They have every fruit and every, every vegetable, regardless of whether it's in season, regardless of whether it's local, it's there. And I went from that to then finding a more local organic grocery store, but it's like literally 20, 30 minutes from home. And I got really tired really fast of trying to drive there multiple times a week. It just, it was becoming a bit of a chore and some would argue grocery shopping is a chore in itself. I actually then stumbled across a local delivery service that is a family owned, a very small family owned farm who produce all their own, their own produce on this big plot of land they have. It's all, for the most part, organic, natural, locally, seasonally produced food. And it's sent to me every week. If you spend over a certain amount, you get it sent to you, otherwise you just pee it up. Either or, it's fine, I really enjoy it. But it's really a different way of living that I never thought about before. And I really enjoy 
the more intimate aspect of knowing where my food's coming from. You know, you get emails from this family and it's like you see the family, you see the growers, you see the cute little family and you see their farm. You know, even if I wanted to drive past their farm today, I probably could. You see the family, you see the food that they grow, you see the land that they grow it on. There's actually been studies to show that eating seasonally is really good for your gut microbiome. When you begin to understand the concept of a lot of these big chain supermarkets, fruit and veg are picked well before they're ripe sent off sometimes it's across the country sometimes it's across the world they're shipped you know thousands of kilometers and they end up in the grocery store and before they even make it out into the shelf sometimes they may be sitting you know on crates or out the back for maybe a day or two they then make it to the grocery store and sometimes that produce can be sitting in the grocery store for a, again a good couple of days maybe even a week before you then decide to go ahead and buy it you buy the produce and then again it may sit in your fridge for two three four five six days depending on when you decide to use that particular item when you buy like for instance this delivery service that i use you know these items the website is only open a, a specific number of days of the week they open up the website and then you log on at a certain time you see what's available you see what's ripe you see what's ready you you know put your order in and then it's sent out to you and then the website's closed down again for another week i really love that concept because the items that i'm picking they are ready they're ripe they're ready to go they're picked and then within a day or two, they're sent to me. A lot of benefits from eating produce that is picked when it's ripe. You still get so much nutrients in those particular fruit and vegetables. Okay, point number three. This one I've seen all over TikTok and all over Instagram, but I've never actually seen people really talk about it. I want to talk about the concept of walking while you work. We've all seen those little treadmills, your little walking pads, you know, they're all over Instagram, all over TikTok. I think January or February, I went ahead and bought a walking pad as per a recommendation of a friend of mine. It has actually drastically changed my day-to-day -day life and my habits. I think we all can agree that we spend a lot more time sitting down than ever before. You know, a lot of us work office jobs, a lot of us work jobs where we're sitting at a desk for, you know, seven, eight hours a day. I love walking outside, don't get me wrong. I love taking plentiful walks. I love getting out about. But sometimes the weather's crap. Sometimes it's raining. I've really been enjoying the concept of working while I walk. I don't do this all day. There are some tasks that I just need to be sitting down for. I prefer to do sitting down. But my emails, you know, catching up on a few errands, a few little, you know, odd jobs on the computer, especially if you have any meetings, you know, over the phone, if you need to make any phone calls, being able to do those things on a walking pad has really helped get my steps up. Walking, even at a slow pace like that, really does help to stabilize blood sugar. Unstable blood sugar levels has been associated with things like inflammation and long-term health problems. So even just at a slow pace like that, it's really beneficial. Okay, so healthy habit number four is actually in regards to not only your physical health, but your mental health. Since coming off hormonal birth control, I really started to listen and become more in tune with my body because I suppose all through my 20s, I went on birth control at age 15. So all through that period of time, I never really had a real period. I never really had a real menstrual cycle. And now that I do experience real menstrual cycles, I actually experience the, the many changes that my body goes through within a month. And I've grown to learn that there are some exercises that just don't work for me, depending on the time of the month. I do love HIIT, don't get me wrong. I love high intensity inter interval training. But when I was on the pill, it was something that I literally could and would do every day. It didn't matter, rain or shine, period or not, I was a high intensity interval training type of type of woman and I've now become a lot more comfortable with saying no to certain things and honoring my body and what it needs. I don't subscribe to a lot of pre-packaged workout classes or pre-arranged PT classes. It was very important for me when I started my swimming that I had an instructor that understood I'm only going to do three weeks out of the month. I do very little high intensity training. I consider swimming to be that. Swimming laps I find exhausting and I'm not I'm not gonna be out here doing that in that specific time of my month. It's just not who I am, it's not how I roll. It's not honoring my body and it's not actually healthy for my body. So there are certain exercises that I do certain times of the month and I no longer subscribe to the notion that you know, regardless of what you're going through, what your body's going through, you should be able to you should be able to do exactly what you did today as you did yesterday. There is a reason why sometimes you might work out and your body just doesn't have the strength for it. Your body doesn't respond the same way. It's actually, I think, kind of damaging to your body to expect it to do certain things that maybe your body is not designed for that day or, the, or that particular time of the month. I think it's really important to honor what your body is telling you. I no longer book my workout classes in advance. I used to be someone who did. I don't do that anymore. I wake up, and depending on how I feel is depending on whether or not I'll go to the workout class or not. And I, don't, I know a lot of people may not have that freedom. I personally prefer to live that way because there's nothing more I hate 
than waking up in the morning and maybe I've got really bad cramps. Maybe I don't feel well. Maybe I didn't sleep very well the night before. And then to know on top of that that I booked a non-refundable like 60 minute freaking hit class or whatever I booked and knowing that I can't get that money back, that just, that frustrates me. So if I wake up in the morning and I feel like I'm in the mood and I have the energy to do something, maybe I'll, I'll wanna go to that class. If I log on and there's no spots available, oh well, I'll just do something on my own. But I do think that honoring your body and what it's asking and what it's what it's wanting from you is really, really key to long-term health. There are certain types of physical activity that I schedule in different parts of the month based on my 28-day hormone cycle. It's the society that we live in, it's not seen as anything that's important. We're living in a society that runs on a 24-hour hormone cycle, which is that of a man. A lot of our life is based on day to day. Women have a 28 day hormone cycle, a 28 day clock, if you will. We have two body clocks. We have our 24 hour body clock. We have our 28 day body clock. And we live in a society that really caters to a male hormone clock, which is a 24 hour clock. But as women, we are not designed, we are not designed like that. And I think honoring your body and what it needs at certain times of the month is really, really key to long-term health. Okay, so point number five, this is unfortunately something that I stopped doing, but I do think it's really made a big difference to my health. I love my coffee machine so much that I got in the habit of waking up first thing in the morning, literally, and within five, 10 minutes, I was making my coffee. I stopped doing that. I now wait anywhere between like hour minimum, but I try to push it to like an hour and a half, two hours before I have my first morning coffee. Doing that actually allows my cortisol levels to balance out naturally before I then stuff my body with coffee. I found that drinking a coffee first thing in the morning, I was interrupting my natural cortisol levels and it was actually making me more sleepy in the afternoon. It was actually making me crash more in the afternoon. And there are studies that have actually shown this. There's research out there that's shown this. I find when I drink my coffee, when I wait for my hormones to kind of stabilize and I get outside first in the morning. I'm fortunate enough to have a balcony. I walk out of my balcony first thing in the morning. I let the sun and the sky and the elements hit me in my dressing gown. <laughs> That's a bit of a wake up for me. That's a wake up I need and I let my body naturally do its thing. But point number six, this is something that I only really came around to within the last week, okay? So this is more of a real time health habit that I'm looking at implementing into my life right now. And that is the concept of rest. And I think that it's only really a bit of a light bulb moment that I only had within the last week, like I said, but I think that we do live in a very hustle, go, go, go culture. And I only came to this realization that I think as a society, we confuse rest for recreation and more leisure activities. To me, I'm now trying to honor rest and I am now more trying to unwind by literally resting. It sounds so simple, but I don't know about you, I used to have the idea of, oh, I need a rest. So I would lay down and then scroll my phone. That's not really resting my body. That's definitely not resting my mind. Having an alcoholic beverage, yes, it's a great way to un unwind, but it's not actually giving my body the rest it needs. I've really tried to incorporate meditation more into my life. I'm not someone who is naturally drawn to meditation. It does take a lot for me to do it and stick to it. Let me know if you like that in the comments down below. But I've actually been trying to incorporate more rest breaks into my day. On my phone scrolling, that's not good for my mind. That's not resting my mind. So it's something that I've been trying to incorporate and it's an idea that I've come around to that I think we do live in a society where we mistake recreation for rest when what our bodies and our minds actually need is rest. They need quiet. They need to lie down, sit down, and just close your eyes, even if it's just for five, 10 minutes, it's been proven to be really regenerative. Rest is a very undervalued thing in society and it's kind of seen as something, a bit of a weakness. Like, oh, you need sleep, oh, you need a rest. I'm all for rest and I'm all for sleep. And it's a healthy habit that I'm trying to better strengthen. I'm trying to improve my sleep hygiene, my sleep health. And I'm also trying to incorporate more rest breaks into my day. Healthy habit number seven. This is something that I started doing earlier on this month when I was in Port Douglas and it was like the perfect place to do it. And when I realized how much better I felt, I started to do it day to day. So this is something and a technique that I have found and it's called grounding. I've heard about it before, but I never really tried it. And now it's something that I try to incorporate into my day to day life. While I was in Queensland, I was doing it for 30 minutes. Apparently it's really good to do it for 30 minutes, but 
sometimes you just don't have 30 minutes. So now I even just try to do it for five, 10 minutes a day. Sitting, standing, you know, barefoot, being in elements, like the, the natural elements, can improve sleep, normalize day-to-day -day cortisol rhythm, it can reduce pain, reduce stress, it can shift the autonomic nervous system from sympathetic towards parasympathetic activation, it can increase your heart rate variability, and it can increase speed wound healing. It can be really good as well for inflammation. There is a ton of research out there that grounding is really good for your body and it's just such a simple thing you know you wouldn't think it you wouldn't think that just sitting on the grass sitting in nature for 5 10 you know 20 30 minutes however much have them however long you have it's been shown to be really really good for you i definitely feel a lot calmer and a lot more relaxed when i'm just laying there sitting there and again don't be on your phone look i've tried it both ways i did it i tried 30 minutes where i was like doo -doo 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 -doo. and i tried 30 minutes where i was literally just laying there listening to the birds, sitting there, listening to nature. I definitely felt better doing the latter. Number eight, let me know in the comments down below, are you a hugger? I never used to be a hugger, but in the last few years, I've become a hugger, okay? I'm a proud hugger. I used to be really weirded out by hugs. I used to be like, oh, okay, yeah, we're touching. Yes, we are, we're touching. And I used to be a back patter, because it's like a, a reflex of how uncomfortable I was. I was like, oh, we're, we're hugging. It's something I try not to do now, but it's just, it's like second nature. I'm a back patter. Um, but I, I do actually enjoy hugs now. I try to incorporate hugs into my day-to-day -day life. And there are studies that show that hugs are really good for you. A good 10 to 15 seconds, like a good genuine hug has been shown to really reduce stress. It apparently releases oxytocin. Oxytocin relieves stress and boosts heart health. It also helps in losing weight, lowering blood pressure, fighting diseases, reducing stress. And it just gives you a good feeling of comfort. A good 10 to 15 second hug is apparently good for your health. And this is something that I've again started to incorporate into my daily life. I give someone a genuine good 10 to 15 second hug every day. Just one person, okay? You don't have to be out giving your hugs out for everyone. But you know, even if, if it's Flynn, okay? Do you think so? Sometimes he genuinely doesn't enjoy it. He's like, get away from me, you crazy lady. And I'm literally squeezing him like, like I've captured him. I'm like, no, don't run from me. This is good for us both. I get a bit deep with you for right now. I don't want it to be too depressing, but I do think we're in a bit of a lonely epidemic. I think we are definitely not as connected as we used to be to fellow human beings. A lot of us work from home, a lot of us live alone. Maybe right now you don't have someone that you live with, maybe there's no one right now in your house or with you right now that you can give a genuine hug to, but if you can, pause this video, come back to me, give someone a really good hug and let me know. Maybe you feel better, maybe you feel more relaxed, less stressed. And if you don't have someone right now, there's someone maybe you can think of right now that you know or you're quite close with that maybe tomorrow you can give them a really good hug. If you're maybe thinking to yourself right now, oh my God, like there's nobody that I'm seeing today or tomorrow or the next day or the day after that or even this week that I think that I can give a nice 10 second hug to, that may be something worth exploring because I do think that we are really lacking connection. I, I know it's something I've struggled with in the past but I do think we're really lacking and it's so underrated. It's such an underrated thing. It's so good for us, you know, humans. We are meant to connect. We are meant, we are social creatures. You know, I'm an introvert, but I still recognize that human connection is so, so important. So without trying to get too serious and too soapy, just find someone to give a hug to, you know, whether it be your pet, okay? Do you think Flynn loves my hugs? Most of the time he hates them. I have to con him into hugging me. Number nine I want to touch on, this is something that I, I learned about after I had my mini back injury, hip injury, I learned about my pelvic floor. And I do think it's a habit and I do think it's a, a muscle that every woman should strengthen, regardless of your age, regardless of where you're at in life, whether you've had kids, whether you haven't, especially if you haven't had children, you ever plan to have children, having a strong pelvic floor is associated with, you know, smooth, childbirth so just keep that in mind it also does have a lot of other benefits that i'll have linked on screen but a good healthy pelvic floor is a really great thing to have it's something that i do every day i do my morning stretches every day and i incorporate just my little pelvic floor exercises in the beginning it was really hard but it's just become second nature to me it's just become a bit of a habit i just right now bit tmi but i'm doing them right now <laughs> so number 10 this last point that i want to leave you with is Something that maybe some of you might not feel comfortable doing, but I just want to just leave this last point with you because I know that where are my fellow people pleasers? 
put your hand up, expose yourself. But I think that there's a lot of talk in the health space about curation and detoxing. And you know, we're more than happy to go on juice detoxes or health diets, you know, food diets. We're more than happy to curate our, our closet or clean out our, our home. But I think there's not enough emphasis on social media diet, social media detox, social media curation. Um, and I think that it's something that everyone should do it every now and again, like a little bit of spring cleaning. And I think if you're a people pleaser, you might really struggle with this because a part of me really does struggle with it, but I've come to realize that it's, it's good for my health and it's good for my mental health. And sometimes you're not going to be liked. Sometimes people are, you're going to, you're going to step on toes and you're going to make people upset. But I do think clearing out your social media every now and again is really good for you. If I look at the type of person I was five years ago, if I look at the, the social media feed that I had five years ago, even as little as like a year ago, it was Birkins, it was Dior, it was, it was Chanel, it was just, it was shopping, it was things. That no longer makes me happy, it no longer lights me up, and it's really bad for my mental health. It makes me feel a bit soulless. And I think, you know, in a world where we're spending so much more time online, clearing out and decluttering and curating a social media feed that makes you feel happy is really good for you. It's so important. When we have a feed that doesn't light us up inside or it makes us feel crap or it just drains our energy, it's not good for our mental health. It's not good for our emotional health. It doesn't mean you hate somebody. It doesn't mean you don't like them. It doesn't mean you have a personal vendetta against them. It just means that maybe their content no longer resonates with you. What they post or what they talk about online no longer resonates with you. And that's fine. You're not always going to, to resonate and you're not always going to connect with everyone throughout your life. People change, people grow, people grow in different directions. And I do think that curating your space online is really important. I think that if you scroll through your social media and you see content from people time and time again that just doesn't sit well with you or it makes you unhappy or doesn't feel good inside, that is a sign that maybe maybe you need to like move on from that and kind of clear out your social media, declutter your social media. I really hope that you got something out of today's video. Let me know in the comments down below what things you might be implementing into your life if any of these were helpful to you. Anything that you want to include in today's list, I'd love for you to share those in the comments down below. Thank you so much for joining me in today's video and I'll see you in my next one. Bye.